You know, uh, this is as good a time as any uh, to get our bearings straight. And the passage that Latrice just read to us is uh, the aftermath of a story of the disciples crossing the Sea of Galilee, one of many excursions that they have taken. And uh, it's a story where some, it's some interesting twists and turns. And I think that what John is saying in, in John chapter 6 has a lot of bearing on our lives Today, as we're at the brink of a new semester, for some of you, you're here at Wheaton Grad for the first time, first day of classes ever. Uh, for others of you, this is yet another trip across the Sea of Galilee, uh, maybe your second or third trip, or fourth or fifth. Uh, it doesn't matter. When you're starting a trip, you need to get your bearings straight. And so as we look to the passage to help us with that, let's pray one more time. Father, it's good to worship with your people. We love you. We rejoice in you. And we rejoice in the fact that you have brought us all here together to be a community of learning and a community of worship. And you're working out your purposes in our lives, even now, even at this moment. And we're excited about today and about this semester and the year. Uh, we're excited about what you're doing in our lives. Pray now, Lord, that uh, you would use the foolishness of my speaking uh, to feed your people. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it must have made for a few good laughs when the disciples sat around the campfire, maybe weeks later, maybe months later, maybe years later, but no one's laughing at this point. It's three o'clock in the morning. It's a dark, dark night on the Sea of Galilee. The disciples have been rowing all night. Their backs are sore. Their hands are beginning to blister. It seems like they're not getting anywhere, and then they see it. Off in the distance, on the horizon, a figure, perhaps illuminated by the moon, coming closer and closer and closer. And one of the disciples shouts out, it's a ghost. Well, what else could it be? And as this figure comes closer and closer and then declares, don't be afraid, it is I, I am. It becomes clear that this figure is Jesus. And, they, and the disciples at that point take Jesus into the boat. And no sooner do they take him into the boat that John tells us that with a thud of the boat against the bottom of the, of the shore, the disciples arrive. So part of John's point is obviously, you know, when it comes to Jesus, if we want to take advantage of Jesus, of the benefits that Jesus provides, we have to believe. We have to be willing to take them on our boat, as it were. So this morning, as I look at this passage, what I want to do is focus in on the benefits of walking with Jesus, the benefits of believing with, uh, in Jesus, and, and why faith, a life of faith, whether as a faculty, a staff, or a student, is uh, so critically important uh, to what we do in our day-to-day -day walk. Here's my first point. If, if we want to believe, uh, then we will have satisfaction. Look at verse 35 with me if you have your Bibles open. Verse 35, Jesus declares, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Now, this is the first of the seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. In this first I am statement, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me, they'll never thirst. And the one who, who comes to me as well, believes in me, uh, will never be hungry as well. Hunger and thirst are, of course, the two basic drives in our lives. Jesus is saying, hey, you won't get very far in your spiritual life unless you come to me, unless you believe in me. Because just as we can't get very far without drinking water from time to time, and we can get a little further with not eating, but not very far, so it is in our walk with God. And so we put together from this verse 35 that there's a parallelism between coming and believing. But I think really important difference here is there's a difference between coming with a small c and coming with a big c to Jesus. Let me explain what I mean. Because I think about the crowds and I think back to John chapter 6, verse 2. A great crowd follows or comes to Jesus um, and then in verse 4 and 5, uh, the Passover is near. Jesus looks up and saw a great crowd coming toward him. 
Verse 15, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him a king by force, the crowds come again. In verse 24, once the crowds realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got in the boats and they came after Jesus. So the crowds are coming after Jesus. And you would think by the logic of verse 35 that I just read, well, they must be believing in him, right? Wrong. Because there's coming and then there's coming. My wife is from Missouri. Uh, the Missouri is a show me state. Anyone here from Missouri? Woo! Okay. Show me state, right? The show me state says, you know, I'll believe it once I see it. I'll believe it once I see it. So show me what you need to show me, and then I'll believe. But the truth of the matter is, on Jesus' re- line of reasoning, just because you see it doesn't mean you're going to believe it. And that's an important point for us because you're going to see Jesus all the time in the days and weeks and months to come. You've already seen him here this morning. You've seen him in the singing. You've seen his name up on the slide. You'll see him in some of your textbooks. When you open up the Bible, you're going to see Jesus. You'll see images of Jesus, symbols of Jesus, people who are impacted by Jesus. You're going to see Jesus all around. But seeing Jesus is not the same as believing in Jesus. So you might be in a culture of Jesus. You you might sense Jesus is there, but that's not the same thing as believing in Jesus. If you want to be satisfied in your Christian life, it's not enough just to see Jesus and see him around and, and take part of the ethos or the culture. You have to dig deep. And you have to make up your mind that you're going to believe in him. And and the reason I say this is because of verse 27. Jesus says, don't work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Now, the crowds have been seeing Jesus all the time, and they've been coming after him, well, for various reasons. The crowds have come after Jesus because he's a good act. The crowds have been coming after Jesus for a free meal. The crowds have been coming after Jesus because they're looking for a political leader. So there's all kinds of reasons people are coming after Jesus, but Jesus is saying, you're still not getting it right. You might see me, but you're not doing the work of believing. And in the the paradox here, friends, is believing is at once the easiest thing to do uh, and the hardest thing to do. Because to live this Christian life, uh, we need to be engaged in the disciplines of prayer and Bible study and fellowship. And, and we have to work ourselves up into a holy sweat because following God is not easy. Amen? Amen. But when we believe, we have start in on this task of discipleship. And that is the work that he's calling us to. But remember, back to the crowds, they are looking for Jesus to do a certain thing. Uh, whatever their agenda is, just like we can do sometimes. And Jesus is saying, look, you won't have satisfaction unless you believe for the right reasons. One time I remember I was coming home, uh, walked in the house, hadn't had breakfast that morning. It was about 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Hadn't eaten all day. So I'm just absolutely famished. So I open up the cupboard. Oh, there's a can of tuna fish. Perfect. I love tuna fish sandwiches. And then, oh, and then we have tomatoes and we have lettuce there. And I just said, you know, I'm going to make a, I'm going to use a whole can of tuna, make a big tuna fish sandwich. Oh, we got this perfect bread here. You know, it's organic bread, you know, big, nice, thick slices. And so I'm just laying it out, chop up the celery, got the tuna fish on the bread, put on some lettuce, put on tomato, you know, get some chips. And I sit down. Perfect. What a way to end the day. So I start eating my tuna fish sandwich and I'm eating my tuna fish sandwich, and I'm about a third way through my tuna fish sandwich, and I lift it up one more time, and I see a green and white fuzzy mold on the bottom bread. And uh, I just threw it away right away in revulsion. You know, Jesus says, be careful about the bread that you eat. It might taste good going down. But we can fool ourselves with what really satisfies us. You see, some of us, we we come here and we're having, our heart really hasn't made up its mind where it's going to seek satisfaction. For some of you, you, you seek satisfaction in the approval of others. Maybe it's the approval of your professors. Maybe it's the approval of the students around you. Maybe it's the folks back home who sent you here. And, and your bread is to get their approval. 
For others of you, your, your approval is to be successful, to, to make it big, to feel a sense of empowerment. Maybe, maybe you, you feel like I, I know exactly what the next step is in the career move that I have. That's my bread. For others of us, we struggle with addictions, maybe pornography, and our bread becomes something like that. You see, there's lots of counterfeit breads out there, but Jesus says, be careful. Don't satisfy yourselves on fake bread. Don't satisfy yourselves on the moldy bread. There's only one type of bread that will last forever, and that's the bread that I give you. But there's something else we need to look at here if we we're going to put our trust in Jesus, and that is that Jesus gives us hope. He gives us hope. Well, what kind of hope? Well, first of all, it's a singular hope. Verse 38 and 39, go with me there. Jesus says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all, all that he has given me, but raise him up on the last day. So why, after all, did Jesus come? Did Jesus come to make us happy? Did Jesus come to make us fulfilled? Did Jesus come to make us feel better about ourselves? Why did Jesus come? John says none of these things. The, reason, the only reason Jesus says he comes in this verse, and there's one and one reason only, and that is that I might lose none of what he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. According to John, there's only one reason why Jesus came, and, and that's not even to get you out of the pit of hell either. The reason Jesus came is to bring in, to usher in this new resurrection reality, this new creation. And by God's grace, as we put our, our trust in Jesus, we can participate in that new resurrection reality. That's why Jesus came. So it's a singular hope, and we put our trust in that singular hope. But it's also a sensory hope. And let, let me tell you what I mean by that, by looking at verse 53. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. You know, if you think about it, that's really gross. In fact, one time I was teaching on this, and, and my, my son said to me, after I was done, he said, you know, I don't know, sure, I like what you said about it. Sounds very sexual. I said, that's just about the point. Jesus is talking about intimacy. You see, the truth is, friends, Jesus is really into you. And in fact, he is so into you that part of the reason he gives the sacrament of the Lord's Supper is he wants to symbolize the degree of intimacy he wants with you. He wants you to eat his flesh, to drink his blood. It's a sensory hope. And so our Christian experience should really be an experience where we're digging deep in a relationship with God, where we're sensing the, the, the fellowship through the spirit of Jesus' presence in our lives. It's a singular hope, it's a sensory hope, but it's also a secure hope. Verse 37, all that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. And that's an amazing verse. When Jesus says, all that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. And maybe you're here and you say, yeah, I, I know, but like, you don't know what I've done. You, you don't know what I've been up to this summer. You don't know the things that I've struggled with. And, and part of you feels driven away by Jesus. But Jesus says very clearly, verse 37, I will never drive him or her away. When we believe in Jesus, we have a secure hope that we can come to him. This past summer, I uh, decided to take a trip with my two boys, 18 and 19, to Quebec City. And uh, anyone, who's from Quebec? Woo! All right, good. So, uh, so as we, I got up at 3 o'clock, we got up at 3 o'clock in the morning, planned to be there around midnight that same day, long trip, and uh, Got a big thermos of coffee. Already, by the time we're into Michigan, I'm already tired, and I'm driving, <laughs> and I'm driving, and I'm driving, and uh, we're getting to Port Huron, which is close to the border, maybe about six, seven hours into the trip. And then I start going through the mental checklist. Did I pack everything? Suitcase? Passport? Passport, yes. 
But then it occurred to me, did I check the expiration date on the passport? <laughs> and we're going closer and closer, and I'm, I'm thinking, what am I going to do? <laughs> We've been driving, what, you know, uh, we got the hotel room already booked, it's prepaid, we can't turn around, what are we going to do? And, and it was packed away in a different part of the car. I didn't want to pull the car over, but for about 30 minutes I was in agony, wondering uh, whether we had an expired passport. So thankfully, when we got to the border, I pulled it out, and there it was. I'm good, and my boys were good. We could get in. And the thing, nice thing about a passport is, you know, it says something about who you are. Uh, and it says, also says that you have a certain security. So these days, having a U.S. passport can get you into Canada pretty securely. And you can get back pretty securely, uh, you know, assuming you behave yourself, uh, with, the, with the passport. Well, you know, what, I think what Jesus is saying here when, when he's talking about hope is, you know, we have another kind of passport. And this came home to me just the other day when we were welcoming the BGC scholars, uh, people from all over the world, seeing the flags upstairs in the Wilson Suite lining the room. And there's the American flag lined up with all the other flags. You see, we have, a lots, of, we have lots of countries represented here, lots of passports in our pockets. But there is a, an allegiance and a passport that you're carrying that puts all our human passports in the shade. And that's a passport to the kingdom of God. And when you appear before Jesus on the final day, you, he, you know, there's different ways to ask this. He might say, have you put your trust in me for forgiveness of sins? And you say, yes, Lord, I have. Have you, have you believed in me? Ha, have you done the works that are appropriate to the kingdom of God? Yes, Lord, I have. But another question he might ask you is, I want to see the picture on your passport, and I want to see my blood on your lips and my flesh in your teeth. Did you eat deeply? Did you drink deeply? That's why I came. And that's why we're here. Let me make one more point as I wrap up. God wants us to have satisfaction in him, hope in him, but there's also guidance. Go with me to verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. How does God avail himself to us? Well, or how do we avail ourselves of God? First of all, we respond to God's timing. Verse 45 says it very clearly. They will all be taught by God. It's written in the prophets. It's written in Isaiah 54. Isaiah was looking forward to the time when a new age would come in and, they, and people would have a depth of listening to God that they've never had before. But we will also respond uh, to God's instruction. They will listen to the Father. Everyone who learns from him comes to me. Did you get that? Everyone who learns from the Father comes to Jesus. We're all here to learn, aren't we? We're ultimately here to learn from Jesus. How do you know if you're really learning from Jesus? If you're coming to him. Any point in the semester you find yourself not coming to him anymore, it might be a good indication you're not really learning from him anymore. The best barometer of whether you're learning from Jesus, the point of why we're all here, is whether you come to him. Make sure you make the time to take satisfaction in God, put your hope in, and finally make time just to be still before God, to get his guidance. You have to believe. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving Jesus bread of life so that we might partake and partake deeply and richly. Thank you for raising him up so that we might be raised up for this hope. Pray now uh, a word of blessing on our students, on our faculty, on our staff as they commence a new semester. Go with us, O oh Lord, we pray. We are so in desperate need of your grace. Be with us in our community, our conversations, and our classes. Be with us in our families. Surround us, O oh Lord, we pray.